Welcome to NASA Edge, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're here on the press site at NASA Kennedy Space Center in what is cloudy Florida. We have an historic launch today because we have the SpaceX Falcon 9 CRS-10 mission ready to go from Pad 39A, which is going to bring up 5,500 pounds of science experiments, research equipment, supplies bound for the International Space Station. And one of those cool instruments that is going up on the Dragon capsule is the SAGE-3 experiment, or the Stratospheric and Aerosols Gas Experiment. To kick things off, we have our special guest, Dave Bowles, who was with us yesterday. Uh, Dave is the director at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. How are you doing, Dave? Doing great. Thanks for having me back. So speaking about SAGE and, and Langley, what, how is SAGE and uh, NASA Langley sort of related? Well, it's a long history. Actually, this is called SAGE-3, so actually the uh, first SAGE went up in 1979. Uh, we had SAGE-2 in the mid-80s, really looking at the ozone, ozone layer around the Earth and, and monitoring that, and has actually resulted in uh, making some changes in what kind of chemicals uh, we can use here on Earth. The ozone is starting to recover, and this is just another critical step in monitoring what's going on and having that continuity measurements. So you really know, exciting. You know, Langley uh, started out as an aeronautics facility, we know yes. that, and but over the course of time we did uh, enter into the field of science and we have actually have a rich history of science. Yes, no, uh, good point. You know, obviously our heritage is in aeronautics and then in the 60s we were looking at, uh, you know, air density and things like that, really more focused on uh, how it affects flight. But then we brought in some, you know, really looking at the atmospheric chemistry to understand what's going on. And from then we've uh, really had a rich tradition. A lot of uh, satellites we've launched Earth observing satellites. We have several on orbit now. Calypso, probably the longest one, has been up there for 10 years right. collecting valuable data. So, yeah, very, very rich part of our heritage. And of course, uh, 2017, uh, it's, a, it's a huge year for NASA yes. Langley. It's our centennial. Yes, it is. Yes. It's, it's hard to believe. We <laughs> broke ground on the uh, first building there in Hampton in 1917 in July. So, we have uh, our official. 100th uh, centennial is July 2017. We have a lot of events coming up. Celebrate all across everything we've done. Aeronautics, science, human exploration. The space program actually started at NASA Langley in the 50s right. with the original Project Mercury. Well, I tell you what, Dave, uh, you know, Langley's had a rich 100 years. We're looking forward to the next 100 years at yes. NASA Langley. And I'm sure that you know, the technology in the next 100 years is just going to be phenomenal. Hard to imagine. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure if uh, in 1917, they couldn't imagine everything we're doing now. So, uh, well, Dave, thank you so much and, for, uh, I think I we're feel about the to get, I, I feel the raindrops. Rain uh, the and, rain and it's, it's a perfect segue because uh, we're going to go now to uh, a segment that I did with uh, Rich Ekman, who is the project scientist for uh, SAGE and also the program manager for ACMAP. So let's check it out. So Rich, you're the program manager for the Atmospheric Composition Modeling and Analysis Program at NASA headquarters. What's that program all about? Yeah, uh, the, the ACMAP program, as we call it, uh, supports a wide range of investigations dealing with ozone and other trace gases in the atmosphere, as well as aerosols. Uh, stratospheric ozone has been a, a major focus of the program for decades. Increasingly, though, tropospheric ozone, the ozone nearer to the ground, as well as uh, aerosols in the atmosphere have increased in importance particularly due to their impacts on human health. So you're program scientist for a very important Earth science mission called SAGE-3. How does SAGE-3 fit into ACMAP? Um, almost perfectly, actually. SAGE-3 will continue a very long-term record of atmospheric ozone measurements. And instruments like SAGE have been uh, key players in the data sources used by investigators uh, working in my program. So I assume SAGE-3 is a third in a series of, of SAGE satellites. So how has SAGE changed over time? Uh, the first SAGE was launched in 1979, and then SAGE-2 just uh, a few years later. Obviously, technology development has been dramatic over the past few decades. And the current iteration of SAGE instruments, the SAGE-3 series, of which there were three copies built in the late 1990s, have taken advantage of some of those technology developments. We're able to measure additional constituents in the atmosphere that have an impact on ozone chemistry. We're able to make measurements using other light sources. We've traditionally used the sun 
for a technique called solar occultation to measure the levels of ozone in the atmosphere. With SAGE-3, we're able to uh, use the moon, a much less bright light source, but still a source that can be used. And uh, so we're able to get additional geographical coverage of measurements of ozone as a result of these new measurement techniques. Why the International Space Station for SAGE-3 and not a normal satellite that would orbit the Earth? There are a couple reasons for that. The, the first is the orbit of the space station, which is a, a very good mid-latitude orbit. So uh, with SAGE attached to the space station, we're able to view ozone from around 55 degrees north latitude to the same level in the southern hemisphere. So unlike a, a typical polar orbiting satellite, we have very good mid-latitude coverage. Another issue is cost. Uh, attaching SAGE to the space station is a good deal less costly than a free flyer with a dedicated spacecraft bus and the various right. communications uh, hardware that would be necessary. Now, it seems to me that in that occultation process that uh, the, orbit, the orbit of the ISS would actually be very advantageous. Is that sort of the rationale? Absolutely, because um, you can't move the Earth, you can't move the Sun. The only thing you can do is choose the orbit you're in. And so since we do occultation where we look at the Sun and watch it set through the atmosphere, uh, and that gives us our spectral signatures of all the absorbing gases and, and a vertical profile through the atmosphere, uh, the orbit's key. And the SAGE-2 is in a 57 degree orbit, lasted 21 years, fabulous data set. And we've always wanted to put a SAGE-3 in a similar orbit. And the only game in town is Space Station. It's a fabulous platform. It's got lots of power, great communications, super team of people to work with. So we're, we're really excited to be going there. Looking forward to arriving. Yeah, and so, but it's interesting because the, the astronauts are not going to be the ones doing the work. The instrument's going to do all the work and, and you guys down on the ground are going to be the ones looking at all the data that comes back. Absolutely. They're, they're busy enough doing the other things. So this was this was designed to be fully autonomous uh, mm -hmm. from, from the very outset. And we have a team of uh, mission ops folks back at, at Langley that are going to be uh, planning for the science events. We have some flexibility on what we can do. We're not only looking at the sun and the moon, but we have this ability to just look at scattered light, the blue sky that we have above us today. Uh, there's enough light there to make measurements of ozone and a few other gases. So they, they plan that, they send the command load up to the instrument and it you know, does its thing for the day. Yeah, it's which, and you'll get that data every day and then and analyze we get it, it. We get all the science data every day. Um, we have to wait a little bit for the final met data to come in and then we go in and process it. So typically within a week we have the, the, the answers right there. It's so exciting. Yeah, it's, 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 I can't wait. Uh, it's, it's been a very long time coming. Well, it's interesting because you talked about the previous data set record from, from SAGE earlier. And so you're actually now going to start a whole new uh, continua continuance of that record with uh, even more data. So, so one of the things about NASA is you rarely get to start something, but you're often allowed to carry the ball and continue on. So when I came here, started working in, with NASA in 1988, Sage 1, Sage 2 had already started flying. I started working on Sage 2 data. I got to work the early design phase on Sage 3, so I've been working on this project for 28 years or something. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a very long it's time. It's awesome. And, you know, we're going to get this thing launched, start operating, and the next generation of scientists are there. They're working on Sage 4. So you're just a piece in a, con in a, in a continuum of activity, and you're just expected to do the best you can. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's a fabulous job. Now, uh, just real quick, before we go, because I'm curious about this, you, you, solar occupation, I kind of understand, but the l lunar, ex explain how you're going to do that uh, same process, but with the moon. Yeah, so the, the thing about the moon is it's a million times dimmer. So the first thing you have to do is figure out how are you going to have your instrument change something to give you a factor of a million. And it's, it's very difficult. So we do that on a number of different pieces. We have a solar attenuator that takes out a factor of 200 or so. We can change the integration times on our detector. That gives us a factor of 10. But the key was in dealing with noisier data, but using lots of noisy data. This is kind of equivalent to what the folks that do Fourier transfer transform spectroscopy do. They take a million lousy points. Oh yeah, points. those guys. They take a million lousy points, but it's great data. <laughs> yeah. So with, with Lunar, we take 300 channels 
And instead of you know 10 for ozone with solar, we have 300 of them. And, and just the statistics of that allows it to work. But once you see the moon, you can also go look at the blue sky because it's just, just about the same brightness. So we have this instrument now where the other ones prior stage were just solar occultation. This one does solar occultation, lunar occultation, limb scatter. It's like you guys aren't leaving anything to chance. If there's some data out there, you're going to get it. Well, you never have enough data. <laughs> okay. So, Caitlin, you're the thermal lead for Sage 3. For, you know, projects or missions that have instruments inside the ISS, I don't believe they would really have to worry about thermal as much as you do. Sure. Why is that? Uh, well, because if they're inside the ISS, the environmental control of the station itself would take care of, it would put them in a benign environment where they don't need to worry too much about temperature extremes. So when it comes to thermal testing for the Sage 3, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what you had to do. The goal for the testing is to make sure that we can take all the components of our payload over a wide enough temperature range that we can be confident that they'll operate well in the extremes that they'll see in space, while also not taking them beyond the limits within which they can operate without anything going wrong. Now, all the thermal testing for Sage 3 was done here at Langley. That's right. Tell me the ranges of temperatures that Sage 3 will experience in space. Uh, the ranges we tested over were uh, roughly, you know, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit up to about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't expect it'll actually see that range of temperatures. The instrument actually is kept around room temperature with its heater, so, you know, that's around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, now Sage 3 is, is made of, of several components. Mm -hmm. Did you test them all together in the thermal chamber or was it separate? Well, both. Um, so initially, during the development of each component, uh, we tested them in what we call subsystem testing. So those are shorter tests where we can focus specifically on what the performance is of a particular component. Those are on the order of a couple of weeks in the thermal vacuum chamber. And then once everything was integrated together into the payload, uh, we put that into a larger chamber all together and ran a longer test, which was a little over a month. When Sage 3 arrives to the ISS, it has to be transferred from the capsule to its location on ISS. Mm -hmm. uh, how will that be done and what does temperature have to do with that process? Sure, um, so that's done with the robotic arm on the space station. So the robotic arm will reach into the Dragon trunk, grasp our payload, pull it out, and then attach it to a platform that will translate us over to the location that we're going to end up operating at. And so for thermal, why that matters is there's portions of that translation time where we won't have any power to our survival heaters. The survival heaters are what keeps us warm enough when we're not powered operationally. And so it's important for us to determine ahead of time, how long can we go without that survival power before we're in trouble? So, so there aren't internal heaters that you can remotely turn on while it's being transferred. It has to be hooked up to operate the heaters. Exactly, okay, yes. Okay. So we have heaters um, internal, uh, but we need power coming from somewhere external. So when we're in the Dragon trunk, we're getting power from the Dragon capsule. Um, and then when we're on station, we're getting it from station. Well, I'm thinking that there were maybe like a set of nine volt batteries on there that you can just hit a switch and it just... Unfortunately, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, no, no. So they don't operate independently. Okay. So during the operation of Sage 3, you're going to be going from periods of uh, maybe direct sunlight to when it's going to be in the shadows. Mm -hmm. How were those temperatures tested in the thermal chamber? Um, in the thermal vacuum chamber, we don't actually simulate uh, the temperature profile around an orbit where the temperature is kind of going up and down. But what we do is we look at the uh, maximum and minimum temperatures we expect to see, and we also look at the rate of change. And those things that we test are actually more extreme than what we expect we'll see on orbit. And so that gives us confidence that the payload's gonna operate really well when it's up on space station. And joining us now is the mission operations manager, Brooke Thornton. How you doing, Brooke? Pretty excited. Aren't you? <laughs> Very excited. <laughs> How long have you been working on Sage 3? Almost eight years now. Eight years? Yes. Right, can you just kind of take us through, you know, before we to talk about what you do, is take us through that the, the emotions of working on this uh, instrument for eight years and you're finally going to see it launch? Um, very emotional, very excited. You know, we've I've been on this project since we started putting together the requirements to develop it, go through all the testing with an amazing group of engineers and scientists that we have, and, you know, now prepping for operations and getting ready to finally do my job. Right. So very excited. Now, will you be still uh, working with the with the program, making sure that the spacecraft, I mean, this instrument is healthy and that you're getting the, the, the proper data that you, the scientists need? Yeah, so that's the main, um, my main job is to make sure that 
We're getting all the science data, all the health and status data down. Um, the health and status obviously tells us how healthy the instrument's doing, making sure there's no issues. Um, so the primary job is to make sure it's working right. properly. And then we're going to be working with the scientists to tweak the instrument, make sure we give them the best data right. that they can get. Now take us to it. You're a mission operations manager. Take us to you. The, the, any challenges that, because you have to work not only with the scientists, but I'm assuming you're working with the engineers as well to try to get them to work together. What are some of the challenges of, of being an operations manager? Um, I think that is kind of the biggest challenge is how do we optimize this instrument? Um, luckily, I've got a background in physics and uh, engineering, yeah. so I can kind of do the geek speak if need be <laughs> for the scientists. Right. And, you know, those first 90 days is really when we're going to have the engineers with us to really tweak it and make sure that we're getting the best. After that, the engineers right. will just be around in case there's an anomaly. Right. Now, do you, do you have any plans maybe to move on to stage four down the road or... Uh, at this point, no, they're they're well on their way on stage four, right. and so I would love to be involved um, if they need it. But right now, just concentrating on stage three because it's you know a minimum of three year mission, and could go you know to twenty twenty four with current ISS schedule. Oh, so you'll 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 stay as mission operations manager for the life of the of the mission. Yep. Wow, that that's a huge part of your engineering <laughs> career. Yes, eight years is. plus that that's that's pretty big. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a big uh, that's a NASA career right there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is. Joe, we understand the significance and importance of Sage Three from a science standpoint. Tell us a little bit about the engineering challenges you faced in mounting a, the instruments on the ISS. So one of the things about Sage that makes it unique, uh, aside from the science on the engineering side, is that we were dealing with a mix of legacy hardware that was originally built in some cases to fly on the International Space Station and in other cases was part of the SAGE series that was made to fly on several vehicles. And so integrating legacy hardware with its historical nature and some things that are out of date with the platform that's ISS, which has its own challenges, those two things combined created you know, some issues that we had to overcome. And what were the particular challenges to meet uh, SAGE's goals? We have an instrument that um, really needs to be on a platform that's fairly stable. We also have an optical system. It's a spectrometer, moderate resolution spectrometer. So we have to deal with things like contamination. Both of those things could be a challenge on a, a platform as large and as varied in its use as the International Space Station. So we originally, back in the first concept, and when, even when we restarted, decided that we would need to monitor those two environments, both from a, a vibration perspective and from a contamination perspective, so that we would have information about the health of our instrument on the ISS. What kind of vibration problems or do you have? Right. I mean, how, you know, aren't... Yeah, so you, you can think of uh, all, up to this point, all of the legacy SAGE instruments have flown on some version of a free-flying spacecraft which you can imagine is much smaller, you know, easier to control than a, a large structure like the International Space Station where you've got different things rotating, solar arrays rotating, you've got visiting vehicles that tend to change the attitude of the space station. Those challenges aren't present on a free-flying spacecraft. So whenever we would get a vibration potentially out where we were at, the science team would want to know that. So we had to have a way to at least flag the data for that kind of challenge. And, and that's kind of where the concept for the disturbance monitoring package came from. So that disturbance monitoring system is kind of a way to you know, filter out some of this extraneous data when things aren't yeah. quite as they should be? Yeah, uh, it originally started out um, as a flag, right? So you would, you would tell the science team once they got the raw data on the ground that, hey, you potentially had vibration exceed what your spec would be. However, uh, when we moved along in the concept development, we found that um, the science team could actually use that data to correct for vibration. Even if it was in spec, it would make their measurement better. Nice. Um, so that, that kind of drove us in a particular direction. Not, not that uncommon in engineering design to, to start off with a, a, an idea, and then when you actually get it to deployment, it ends up helping you in ways you didn't even think of originally. We're almost uh, two and a half minutes away. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're almost there. And Light the candle, right? Uh, that's right. So what we're going to be doing here in the next few seconds, we're going to go to uh, the launch commentary and listen to uh, George Diller. Uh, he's going to provide a commentary. He's, he's been doing this for a long 30, time. 30 some years. Can you a imagine long that? Time. I mean, he is the guy for, for launches. Yeah, he's the here. icon for it. He never gets old. Nope. Hey, when's the last time you saw a launch? 
guess 2009 Aries 1X. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's been a while. So you've got to really be oh, jazzed. I'm, I'm pumped and excited. And, and the cool thing about this launch, uh, and, and people don't re uh, really think about this, that Pad 39A is historic because we launched That's Apollo. Awesome. Yes. We launched Shuttle. I know. And now we're launching SpaceX. I know, it's exciting. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So we got <laughs> we, we got the weather. You know, we've, we've, we've got uh, Steve Gaddis, who's our, our, our resident expert for, for, for Edge. And, uh, and George Diller's going to make the call in a few seconds. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to go to the launch commentary and let's listen to George Diller for the final minute. You're watching NASA Edge. Falcon 9's in startup. Dragon is in startup. Stage 1 and Stage 2, pressing for flight. LD verify, go for launch. LD verifies, go for launch. Preparing now to go into terminal count at T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30. T minus 20. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10. T minus 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition and liftoff of the Falcon 9 to the space station on the first commercial launch from Kennedy Space Center's historic Pad 39A. Pad operations on Pad Net A. Copy, welcome. Stage one propulsion is on. Oh, this is great. Our, now, you haven't seen a launch since uh, 2009. How was it, Steve? <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> very awesome. exciting. And, you know, you could hear the cheers and the oh, crowd. Yeah. Very enthusiastic. Obviously, we're happy for the Sage 3 team, happy for SpaceX and all the other missions that are associated with right. this launch. But what a moment. Nothing like it. Well, we just want to thank everybody for joining us, all the support team at KSC TV and the folks at Marshall, Lee Erickson in particular, for uh, coming in and make this happen. And just... Uh, uh, all the Sage 3 team, yep. your, the folks in your office that have helped us along the way. It's just been a great effort. And I really want to give a special shout out to the folks in Europe that uh, uh, were posting comments on our site. Good to have people from across the pond watching the show <laughs> and supporting all that NASA does and that ESA right. does and our other partners do. Yeah, yeah. Good so uh, thanks again, Steve, for being on the show. Glad to be here. Uh, until next time, we're NASA Edge, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. NASA.